and welcome. The 1970s were an odd transitional decade for mainstream comics. Both Marvel and DC experimented with various concepts that were targeted to older, potentially more mature readers. This happened because the Comics Code Authority, the committee that, essentially, censored comics content, relaxed their restrictions to allow for more mature material. This led to both companies publishing some pretty bizarre titles. As an example, there was the socially conscious Green Lantern and Green Arrow run. There was the post-apocalyptic nihilism of Killraven and the Deathlock series. There was the satanic-themed comics of Ghost Rider and the Son of Satan. And finally, there was the muck-encrusted monstrosities of Swamp Thing and Man-Thing. Unlike its DC counterpart, Man-Thing was a character that literally did nothing but walk around a swamp causing terror and doing very little else. A character like Man-Thing needed a supporting cast to keep the concept and the plot moving along. Otherwise, it would be 20 silent pages of a character incapable of speech or an internal monologue walking around in a swamp, occasionally punching an alligator. This need for a constant supporting cast led to the creation of Howard the Duck. Howard first appeared in Adventure into Fear number 19 as a walk-on, throwaway kind of character. The writer of Man-Thing, Steve Gerber, thought it was funny to have an obnoxious, talking duck show up and be a cynical mouthpiece to the absurdity going on in that story. He really wasn't intended to be anything other than a visual gag, something that would add a little oddball variety to the bizarre story being told. For some reason, the editor of Man-Thing, Roy Thomas, hated Howard, and he ordered the character to be killed off, which he was in the following issue. Readers were quite displeased about this development, and they wrote in complaining about Howard's sudden demise. Apparently, according to Roy Thomas, one reader even sent in a dead duck to express their displeasure concerning Howard's fate. Soon thereafter, Howard was brought back for a few solo backup stories in two Man-Thing annuals. The readers rejoiced, and a nerd riot was averted. With Howard's popularity among readers, and with Steve Gerber's profile at Marvel increasing, the character was given his own solo series in 1976, and so began the weird and convoluted publishing history of Howard the Duck. The series itself was a socially conscious satire of modern life, with Howard essentially encountering and poking a sharp stick at various aspects of corporate culture and corporate identity, before that was a thing we could name. Since Howard was a being from another reality, he seemed to perceive our culture in ways that we couldn't, and he couldn't help but question and complain about the ridiculous things we accepted as normal. I don't think it's too much to say that Howard the Duck was the comic book equivalent of a Norman Lear TV show. Unlike every other Marvel character, Howard had no powers whatsoever. He was just a walking, talking duck that had been trapped in this reality because of a shift in the cosmic axis. Even in the reality he came from, he was just another powerless, normal loser. In fact, he didn't do anything particularly well, except maybe complain. Howard wasn't exactly heroic or courageous either. Whenever possible, he'd avoid conflict with whatever protagonist he was up against. Basically, he fled from confrontation, usually with a morally righteous rant trailing behind him. Howard's confidant, and eventual love interest, was Beverly Switzler, a character that was based on the uncredited co-plotter of the Howard comic book, Mary Screenies. Beverly and Howard suffered together and tried to survive the antagonists that personified the weirdness present in the changing cultural landscape. The series had a wide variety of oddball supporting characters, most notably the Kidney Lady, a woman with a very unhealthy obsession with that specific organ. Also included in the cast was the former mental patient, Wendell Wester, and the sleepwalker, Paul Same. Incidentally, Steve Gerber loosely based that character on himself. If any character could be called Howard's nemesis, it would be Dr. Bong, and that was mostly because he had a thing for Beverly Switzler. Otherwise, Dr. Bong had a recurring role, but not one that always directly interfered with Howard's life. Howard's true nemesis was, well, the ridiculous nature of modern life, aspects of which were personified by the various antagonists he encountered throughout the series. One of the really weird things that happened during the comic book's run occurred when Disney contacted Marvel, claiming that Howard was infringing on their Donald Duck character. Oddly enough, the reason Disney made this claim was because in some countries where English isn't the primary language, Donald Duck was synonymous with the word duck. So when Howard the Duck was translated into other languages, there was no linguistic distinction that could be made between Howard and Donald. They were both ducks, therefore they came off as the same character, and that infringed on Disney's copyright. I know that sounds pretty ridiculous, but that was Disney's claim. Instead of getting into a legal hassle with Disney, Marvel agreed to the changes Disney suggested for Howard's design. These suggestions were to minimize the confusion between Donald and Howard. 
Disney requested that Howard be shorter, fatter, have smaller eyes and human toes, and he would have to wear pants. Marvel agreed to these suggestions because, well, who gives a shit about these minor changes, and why get into an expensive legal battle over a cartoon duck? Well, the writer, editor, and creator of Howard the Duck, Steve Gerber, gave a shit. He gave a lot of shits, as a matter of fact. In interviews at the time, he seemed ambivalent about the changes and brushed them off as corporate politics. But privately, he thought these changes were ridiculous, and he resented any interference with the character he had created. Shortly after these changes were suggested, Gerber wrote an entire issue about Howard being forced to dress decently. The antagonist of that issue also put Howard through a Blandatron machine to change his terrible attitude towards everyone and everything. Neither attempt at changing Howard works, though. At the end of the issue, he's the same as he was at the beginning. It's pretty notable that at the end of that issue, Howard is walking away with his bare ass pointed at the reader. Basically, the entire issue, and those final panels in particular, are a big middle finger to everyone involved with the redesign of the character. And in subsequent issues written and edited by Gerber, the character remained as he always had been, duck-like and pantsless, as nature intended. Steve Gerber was an intrinsic part of Howard's success. Not only did he create the character, but he was one of the few people to write him through almost the entire run of the comic book series. Furthermore, he contractually had a say in how Howard was represented in other Marvel comics and in other media. Unlike many writers at Marvel, he was also given a fair amount of autonomy over the Howard the Duck comic, and he could basically do whatever he wanted as long as he stayed within company guidelines. This autonomy was obvious in issues like number 16. In this issue, Gerber didn't know where to take the story next, and he was personally dealing with the stress of moving to Las Vegas. So instead of writing a lousy, half-baked issue, or allowing a filler issue to be run that month, Gerber wrote a rambling text piece that was a conversation between himself and Howard. It was a relatively revealing piece about Gerber writing about himself writing, and how he felt stuck with no place to go except sideways. In a way, it really highlights the differences and the similarities between the writer and the character he writes. Was it a self-indulgent exercise? Without a question. But you kinda can't help but admire the fact that he got away with it. As a trivial aside, Gerber would use the text on the page titled Obligatory Comic Book Fight Scene as the basis for Nevada, the 1988 six-issue miniseries from Vertigo Comics. During the time he was writing the comic book, Gerber was also writing the Howard the Duck syndicated newspaper strip, and he started falling behind schedule. This displeased the newspaper syndicate that distributed the comic strip. Subsequently, Gerber's contract on the strip was terminated due to lateness, and here's where the history of Howard the Duck starts to get messy and bitter. Gerber, who didn't approve of the writer that was taking over the newspaper strip from him, claimed that he had ownership of the Howard the Duck character. He then began legal proceedings to prevent the character from being used by Marvel. There's more to it than that, but that's the basics of the lawsuit. This led to Marvel also cancelling their contract with Gerber, and he was removed as a creator on their comic book line. In other words, he was fired. The editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics at the time, Jim Shooter, would later reveal that Gerber was fired because it made no sense for a company to employ someone who was suing them. Gerber's lateness on some work was a convenient excuse to void the contract he had with the company. Unfortunately, Gerber didn't have a legal claim to ownership. As an employee of Marvel, anything he created automatically became their property. In the end, the legal battle was settled out of court in the 80s. However, the specifics of the agreement are confidential, so it's impossible to determine the legitimacy of Gerber's claim. One factor that may have contributed to this lawsuit being settled is Howard being optioned by George Lucas for a movie. Any legal ambiguity concerning ownership of the character could have delayed production on that film. So it may be possible that Marvel was keen to put this lawsuit behind them so this project could go forward without complications. However, this is speculation. Regardless, following this settlement, Howard the Duck was indisputably the property of Marvel Comics, and Gerber had absolutely no say in how the character was used in comics or any other medium. Nor did Marvel have any obligation to consult Gerber with any changes they decided to make concerning the character. After the 27th issue of Howard the Duck, Steve Gerber was removed from writing the title, and the comic stopped being regularly published with issue 31. But the regular comic was halted in favor of Howard's further adventures being published in a black and white magazine format, not because of diminishing sales on the comic book. The magazine lasted nine issues and it was, well, pretty terrible. It's not even worth talking about to be honest. All I can say about it is, it tried very hard to be funny and edgy because it could explore more adult material within the magazine format, but it just felt cheap and sleazy. 
It's also hard not to notice that once Gerber was removed from the title, that Howard immediately conformed to the changes Disney requested. Even the 80s movie conforms to the requested Disney changes. Furthermore, in the brief cameo Howard made in the 2014 Guardians of the Galaxy movie, he was wearing pants and he had human toes on his previously webbed feet. At the time the movie came out, Disney had bought Marvel, so it's no surprise they enforced that particular look onto Howard. Following the cancellation of the Black and White magazine, it was pretty obvious to those at Marvel Comics that the ongoing adventures of Howard the Duck had run its course. The writers that followed Steve Gerber on the title just couldn't capture the essence that made this misanthropic character appealing. Instead of being a satirical look at modern life, the title became a standard parody of pop culture. And that was a rather generic use of the character. With the black and white magazine cancelled and the lawsuit settled, Marvel approached Steve Gerber and asked if he would be interested in reviving the Howard comic book series. Gerber agreed to return and to try and breathe some life into this languishing character. Unfortunately, the script Gerber submitted was heavily rewritten by the editor and barely resembled the story Gerber set out to tell. The reason editorial had been so ruthless with Gerber's script was due to the story basically invalidating and satirizing the efforts of the writers that followed Gerber on the title. An editorial thought this approach was too much of an insult to those writers, so they edited out these elements. Upon seeing these massive changes, Gerber decided to walk away from the project, thus killing the proposed Howard revival. For the next 20 years, Howard made brief appearances throughout the Marvel Universe. Mostly they were cameo appearances, or he'd appear in the background of a crowd scene. Basically, he went back to being what he was originally created to be, a visual gag with no substance. He was an easter egg for longtime comic book fans, much like his appearance in Guardians of the Galaxy. In 1996, a moment of amazing serendipity occurred, and this is truly a brilliant moment of revenge. That's all it can be called. Brilliant Revenge. Just to set the stage a bit, 1996 was the time when the comic book marketplace was filled with all manner of useless comic books, with equally useless gimmicks that were intended to drive up sales. The specific gimmick in mind was to have Steve Gerber return and write a comic book with Howard the Duck as a supporting character. It would be promoted as a creator returning to his most popular creation. Previously, in 1990, Steve Gerber had returned to write for Marvel. One of the titles he wrote was the comedic comic She-Hulk. During his tenure on that title, Gerber wrote an arc that had included Howard the Duck. At the time, he had the misplaced expectation that Marvel would promote this arc as Gerber and Howard reuniting. However, this did not occur. Moving forward to 1996 again, Marvel approached Gerber and asked if he was interested in writing a Howard the Duck and Spider-Man team-up. Gerber said he was, but at the time he was also busy writing a crossover between Destroyer Duck and the Savage Dragon for Image Comics. Gerber suggested that they do an unofficial crossover, with Destroyer Duck and Savage Dragon appearing in the background of the suggested Howard and Spider-Man team-up comic, and vice versa. And Gerber would write both issues. It was like two gimmicks in one. Marvel agreed, and Gerber wrote both issues of this unofficial crossover. While Gerber worked on this crossover, he learned that Marvel had commissioned a few more Howard appearances in other titles. He believed these other appearances would draw attention away from and greatly diminish the novelty of the crossover he was writing. This apparently irked Gerber a fair amount, and it set into motion the revenge plot that would subsequently occur. While Marvel had editorial control of what appeared in their Howard and Spider-Man comic, they couldn't control the content of the issue Gerber was writing with Destroyer, Duck, and Savage Dragon. But, since Spider-Man and Howard were only going to have a background cameo appearance, they weren't too concerned whether their intellectual property was going to be misused. And they were so, so wrong. In the Destroyer Duck and Savage Dragon comic, Gerber had these characters abduct and rescue Howard and his main squeeze, Beverly, leaving behind cheap clone copies in their place. In other words, Gerber rescued Howard from the Marvel Universe, and any further usage of the character would be irrelevant, because the character was a pale imitation of the real character. It was, and still is, a brilliant moral victory. Admittedly, it was more than a little petty, but you really have to appreciate the fact that Gerber pulled it off, and, on paper at least, he rescued his own creation from his corporate masters. As I said, it was a moral victory. It didn't really mean much to anyone other than to Steve Gerber and to those at Marvel that took note that they had been thoroughly outplayed. Six years later, while this cloned Howard continued to languish in brief appearances here and there throughout the Marvel Comics line, Gerber was asked again if he would like to write a Howard the Duck series. I think, in a way, it was Marvel's attempt to maybe make amends with Gerber and to intellectually reclaim their property. 
If Gerber wrote another Howard the Duck series, they could say the character had actually been returned by the creator that had abducted him. Yeah, that's just speculation on my part, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of the reason Gerber was offered to write the character again. Regardless, Gerber did agree, and what resulted was a six-issue miniseries for Marvel's adult line of comics. And it is brilliant. To me, it reads like a creator realizing this is probably his last chance to write a character that he loves and completely understands. And with the comic book being restricted to adults, he could be unrestrained in the content. Gerber put it all out there, basically satirizing the vertical line of comics, while also paying respect to the spiritual successor of Howard, Spider Jerusalem. At the end, Howard meets God, and they have a truly profound conversation about what it means to be a creator, and what that possibly means to be the creation. It's a beautiful ending, and it feels like Steve is taking the opportunity to say goodbye to his creation, and to finally let him go. This would be, in fact, the final time Steve Gerber got the opportunity to write Howard the Duck. He died two years later, in 2008. Marvel did try to revive the character in 2007, with a miniseries written by Ty Templeton, but it didn't go anywhere. Then, with the nerd boners that popped up over Howard's cameo appearance in the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, Marvel has launched and then relaunched a Howard the Duck comic written by Chip Zdarsky. But neither series lasted long. The demand for a regular, ongoing comic book starring Howard the Duck just isn't there, despite the nerd joy expressed at seeing Howard briefly in a movie. And that may have to do with the possibility that the character just doesn't have the same satirical edge that he once did when written by Steve Gerber. The further adventures of Howard the Duck in the 21st century are amusing, sure, but they also reflect how different the management of Marvel is in the modern age. Not a lot of chances are taken at Marvel Comics anymore, unlike during the 60s and the 70s. It seems that a lot of energy is spent protecting and expanding on their intellectual property, because, you know, they are now owned by Disney, and because the Marvel Cinematic Universe is very alive and very well. With the success of Guardians of the Galaxy, a D-tier comic book that barely had any presence in their comic book line, Marvel surely understands that even their unsuccessful comic books could be turned into a billion-dollar movie franchise, if handled properly. Also, Howard is an oddity, a quirk of publishing. If he didn't already exist, there would be no one at Marvel trying to create him now. He's that unique, and he's mostly representative of a time in popular culture that has long since passed. In the end, Howard is a character that is no longer trapped in a world he didn't make. He's now a character trapped in a company that probably has no use for him. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.